Good afternoon and a warm welcome to the many Africa Center alumni who have joined us today for the webinar on countering transnational organized crime entitled Understanding Vulnerabilities to Transnational Organized Crime, Violence, State Legitimacy, and Livelihood Challenges. My name is Dr. Anwar Bukhars, and I am the Professor of Countering Terrorism and Countering Violent Extremism at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. I am pleased to be the moderator of this webinar. Although we cannot all see each other today, I mean, let me command the enthusiasm of the alumni community that has joined us. You represent many different countries across the continent with a variety of experiences in security and justice domains and with both military and civilian backgrounds. This webinar is the third in the Africa Center's monthly webinar series about professional development for countering transnational organized crimes in Africa. Today's webinar will shine further light on the vulnerabilities that African states often face <clears throat> to transnational organized crime. In particular, our distinguished panelists will discuss violence, state legitimacy, and economic livelihood challenges that shape the enabling environment for transnational organized crime. We must understand these vulnerabilities in order to identify the best ways for African states to build resilience to transnational organized crime. Resilience will be the subject of future webinars in this series in 2021. <clears throat> we hope that uh, by the end of the webinar, <clears throat> you will you know, show uh, understanding of how political violence, state legitimacy, and livelihood challenges linked to various megatrends can create vulnerabilities to transnational organized crime. Analyze how vulnerabilities have differential impacts on women, on marginalized populations, as well as whether these vulnerabilities have changed with COVID-19. And to consider <clears throat> what kind of factors can foster resilience to transnational organized crime in contexts characterized by political violence, low state legitimacy, and livelihood challenges. I am pleased to welcome two outstanding and seasoned experts on transnational organized crime who will help us to start the conversation about the objectives of this webinar. As you have their bios posted on the webinar series website, I will highlight just you know, some of the most relevant aspects of their bios to this webinar. We'll start with Dr. Peter Anjak. He's a visiting fellow here at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies where he supports uh, the Africa Center's Emerging Leaders Academic Programs and advises on engaging the rising generation African security sector leaders across the Africa Center's activities. He also contributes to the Africa Center's academic programming and research on national security strategy development and managing security resources. And he advises on mega trends shaping the African security landscape in 2030. Before joining us at the Africa Center, he was an analyst for UNSF as the country director and senior advisor in South Sudan for the International Growth Center. And he was the, in, the in-country economist for the World Bank and the coordinator of policy and strategy in the office of the Minister of National Security, in the office of the president of South Sudan. Uh, he's an Africa Center alumnus and he earned his PhD in politics and international studies from the University of Cambridge, Trinity College. And then we have uh, Dr. Catherine Lena Killey. Uh, she's assistant professor of justice and rule of law here at the Africa Center. And, and she is the faculty lead, the architect of this academic program of countering transnational organized crime. Before joining us at the center, Dr. Killey was a research advisor of the American Bar Association Rule of Law Initiative and she took her to several countries in the continent, West and Center, 
Af Central Africa to support teams doing rule of law development work. She is the author of a number of publications, and most recently, a re recent uh, well-received uh, book on party politics in Francophone Africa. Based centrally on academic research, she conducted while living in Senegal. She holds a PhD and an MA in government from Harvard University. So with that, we'll start, uh, <clears throat> we'll start our, our conversation. Uh, and I'll start with, with Peter. Uh, Peter, can you explain you know, how political violence and African state governance related legitimacy challenges create vulnerabilities to transnational organized crime? Peter, over to you. Six minutes. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Anwar, uh, for that generous introduction to, on your side. And uh, I'm glad also to Dr. Kat uh, for joining me this morning in this important conversation and for her leadership really in uh, providing this platform for us to discuss this central issue that threatened the security of Africa as a whole. Uh, getting into your question, I think it's probably worthwhile to remind our uh, audience of uh, some of the discussions that we have been having, particularly uh, the definition of the organized crime. I think that would be a very good uh, way to get into the question of vulnerabilities. And I think this was emphasized in the first webinar that we had, that when we are talking about organized crimes, we are talking about illegal activities conducted by groups or networks acting in concert by engaging in violence, corruption, or related activities in order to obtain directly or indirectly a financial or material benefit. And of course, as we know, these uh, activities can be, can be conducted within and outside the country. Now, every environment in which uh, there is questions of legitimacy, when a state is not performing well, when it is not able to uh, prioritize the needs of its citizens, it creates an opportunity for criminal activities to take place in this, uh, in this, in this kind of context. And when you add in uh, the unique challenge of conflict, particularly armed conflict, what this does really it's a, is it's a really accelerate uh, not just only the vulnerabilities, but even the magnitude of the challenges. And it does this really by affecting the three variables that were highlighted when we were talking about the ENACT uh, index. Uh, and this is uh, criminal actors, uh, we are also criminal markets, and also it affects the resilience. I think it's important to go through each one of them uh, to, to highlight how really uh, they, they, they work out. So whenever you have a, a conflict in a country, and uh, I come from South Sudan, as you highlighted before, and Horn of Africa, we have really uh, about uh, five countries that are involved in one way or another in conflict, uh, Sudan, uh, you know, just recently had uh, conflict ended with the signing of the Juba Peace Agreement. South Sudan has been experiencing conflict uh, since 2013. Somalia, of course, is a situation we are well aware of, has been happening for more than three decades. Uh, and of course, Ethiopia, uh, just a month ago, uh, again, entered into a situation of conflict which or to a certain extent may have also involved Eritrea. So that really leaves uh, Kenya and Uganda as the only stable environments. And whenever you have a conflict that happened in these environments, uh, it, it increased the number of criminal actors that are operating. Uh, it does this, first of all, by creating opportunities for uh, foreign criminal actors to actually come in and, uh, and try to uh, make financial gains uh, through corruption, of course, and through violence. And this is all kind of actors, arm dealers, uh, drug dealers, human uh, traffickers, wildlife traffickers, uh, all of them, they come to this environment of conflict to, to thrive. And of course, we know that uh, conflict also uh, further uh, more vulnerabilities. So things like humanitarian aid become an issue. And whenever there is a conflict, uh, it attracts the entrepreneurial violence that make money primarily uh, through conflict. So that is one. Uh, so the second part is that criminal market, uh, it actually, conflict actually enhances and expand the existing criminal, uh, criminal markets. Uh, and these include uh, in all sorts of ways, it create new opportunities because now 
with conflict, the state is distracted and it is not able to project authority in the way that it used to do before. Uh, and the capacity of the state also become limited. Uh, war become the main priority, all the resources are directed uh, to war. Uh, law enforcement uh, is no longer really prioritized as the military now became uh, the main issue. So again, it create opportunities for uh, drug trafficking, for arm dealers and uh, human traffickers, and particularly in an environment where a state uh, capacity is weak, uh, a state is really not able to control all the arsenal of war that is coming in, uh, that is being used to fight the war. Well, we know now from the case of South Sudan, how some generals have been able to even take the ammunition, uh, sell it to the civilians and all different sites that are engaged in the conflict. And I'm sure now with this crisis in, uh, in Ethiopia, uh, there is a real worry with the influx of refugees uh, into neighboring countries uh, that uh, the market is enormously expand. And, and for the rebels themselves, in order to finance the war, they have to engage in all sorts of economic activities. There will be, of course, in timber, in natural resources, in gold, and all those, of, uh, all those things uh, that are engaged. The third thing that the conflict does is that it reduces the resilience of the state to actually respond. Uh, to the ch unique challenges of organized crimes. As I mentioned to you before, uh, conflict become the main priority and became the, it becomes the main angle around which the state sees everything. Uh, so uh, uh, resources are not invested uh, in things that can enhance state capability. War become the main focus. And as war become main focus, uh, the state is really distracted. So uh, police, and the other law enforcement agencies are no longer prioritized or are unable uh, to get the resources they need. In some cases, they're actually uh, uh, diverted to the army. Uh, they no longer operate independently. They become part of the larger efforts uh, to wage the war. And we know that most of the conflict we face in Africa are internal and are within uh, the borders uh, of, of each state. Uh, they are not a state-to-state -state war. Uh, they are usually uh, civil wars. And civil wars also further divide societies. And with these divisions, uh, the state legitimacy is questioned even more. So uh, conflict uh, uh, by itself is a huge problem. But when it occurs in an environment where the states already lack legitimacy or there are legitimacy concerns, it further now uh, enhances really an opportunity for criminal actors to come in, uh, for the market to expand, and for the state capacity to tackle them to reduce further. All right, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Again, we, we hear a conflict is an enabler of organized crime, how it attracts entrepreneurs of conflict, how it enhances uh, criminal markets capacity, especially in contexts where states you know, are fragile uh, uh, and where states obviously lack uh, uh, legitimacy here. So I'll turn to Kat and I'll throw the same question at you, obviously, from your own background and uh, and from uh, uh, your own uh, context. So Kat, please. Thanks, Anwar. And thanks, Peter. That was really well said and nicely broken down in terms of different elements of the index as well and how those fit into our discussion of vulnerabilities. Um, yeah, so I'll just add a little bit. Um, I think a lot of what Peter said um, also resonates in the Sahel region and wider West Africa, Central Africa. Um, so I'll try to speak a little bit briefly to each of the three things. So first, in terms of political violence, um, you know, many countries um, in the region um, in West Africa are currently experiencing, um, th that are currently experiencing protracted conflict or violence may also show up in the high criminality category on the index. So this reinforces sort of Peter's point. Um, I think if you look at any region, we will see that correlation. And various kinds of political violence, whether we're talking about terrorism and violent extremism or civil war and its aftermath, these different kinds of violence can create opportunities for organized criminals and for transnational organized criminal networks to thrive. And so in the Sahel in particular, um, by the Africa Center Zone um, count, um, based on other data sources, violent events linked to militant Islamist groups have doubled every year since 2015 in the region. And over the last decade or so, we've sort of seen the expansion and movement of these violent extremist threats spread across the region. We saw it in Algeria and Libya, and then Northern Mali. Things have moved into Central Mali. 
the Lip Taco Gourmet region. And we've seen similar um, expansionary dynamics um, recently in uh, the Lake Chad Basin, you know, looking at Boko Haram in northeastern Nigeria and then in neighboring countries. Um, so that's one kind of violence that could increase African states' vulnerabilities to transnational organized crime. We also have several countries in the region that have at some point in the last 10, 20 years experienced the civil war. So I'm thinking of Cote d'Ivoire, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and um, in the war and, and post-war setting, um, that those pose particular challenges as well. And there may be some vulnerabilities, again, as per Peter had, had described for other regions on the continent. But both kinds of conflict are essentially reducing the power of the state to control and regulate its borders. Um, this can provide new opportunities for organized criminal actors to exploit those vulnerable borders. Both kinds of conflict can increase demands for small arms and light weapons trafficking, and that alone can bring other forms of trafficking with it in certain cases. We see increased, um, we see um, that this can also lead, um, whether we're talking about terrorism or, or war, can lead to internal displacement or forced migrations that bring with them heightened risks for trafficking in persons. Um, just those risks rise just as people are entering into a situation in which non-state armed groups have, um, in, in, in which, um, you know, they're, they're fleeing um, or, or moving um, and sort of completely uprooting themselves politically, economically, and socially, uh, you know, as a result of some of this violence. I think that um, both kinds of conflict can also create conditions in which um, non-state armed groups take control of natural resources. And that itself can also foster new forms of illegal mining or illegal logging or poaching. Um, we've seen um, in Central Africa, the LRA and Garamba National Park, um, you know, historically, um, that's one interesting example. Um, we look, if we look at artisanal gold mining sites in Burkina Faso, Niger, Benin, or Togo, um, you know, there are interesting opportunities here for violent extremist groups and or criminal networks to work together in different ways or at least coexist in different ways that may um, exacerbate vulnerabilities. Um, so that's um, one element. Um, I think, um, you know, even countries that are not affected by large scale protracted conflict um, of some sort, um, economic livelihood issues may also um, create other vulnerabilities. If criminal actors are looking to get locals networked into their activities, they might look to groups that are economically marginalized um, that could find employment or, or um, something maybe even beyond a livelihood by becoming part of these networks or groups. Um, in addition, people might find the presence of certain criminal markets in their communities as part of the local economy useful as sources of income, even if they aren't directly involved in organized criminal activities. Um, they may be secondarily linked to that economy. So just some examples there. Um, we um, can see sometimes people are getting employed as small scale facilitators for organized crime, but sometimes it's about acquiring wealth much beyond that not just securing a livelihood. So if we look historically in the earlier 2010s at Guinea-Bissau um, or Mali, um, studies based on focus groups with citizens in these communities and these areas suggest that um, you know, drug trafficking at the time increasingly attracted youth, youth who were then able to make um, really conspicuous um, large scale purchases of cars, houses, um, and that attracted other youth who, for fault of lack of other opportunities, dropped their educational priorities and, and would um, find it quite tempting to join these kinds of trafficking groups. In other cases, as I said, people are less directly involved in um, organized crime um, because they're just part of broader economies that are secondarily related to it. So in northern Niger, for example, near Agadez, up until the 2015 law was passed to criminalize human smuggling there, um, you know, uh, there were people who were formally involved in the human smuggling economy, drivers, recruiters, coordinators of these networks to smuggle people. Um, but there were also other community members who were selling water or food um, just to people um, who were involved in these supply chains. They might be providing lodging along the way, um, knowing or not knowing um, what's going on, or selling phone credits or internet access, other supplies along the way. 
Um, so you also see um, that element linking into livelihoods. I could say a lot about state legitimacy in relation to um, Sahelian states, in particular places where the central state's not really consistently present to provide services. Um, states in um, particular areas um, where that's the case don't necessarily enjoy a great deal of governance-based legitimacy. And um, they may have difficulty protecting, much less offering a broader social contract to citizens there. And this just generally can open up opportunities for criminal groups, as well as violent extremist organizations to vie for control over that territory. Um, so there's a lot more to be said there, um, but I think I'll leave it at that um, so we can move the discussion forward. Thanks. Absolutely. Um, that, thank you, Kat talking to us about the political economy of organized crime and how different people are engaged in, uh, in transnational organized crime for different reasons. So the issue of livelihood is, is critical. So, you know, state, state vulnerability, as we have heard, to transnational organized crime, it arises from a multi-dimensional combination, right, of various conditions. Uh, and, and, and of course, any discussion surrounding you know, vulnerabilities to organized crime must reflect the reality that not all states are equal in their susceptibility to transnational organized crime. I mean, uh, conflict is, is, is critical, but it's not the only driver, of, uh, it's not the only driver of organized crime. In fact, we have a question in the chat uh, uh, today that talks about the case of, <clears throat> of South, South Africa and uh, in which there is no conflict, but there are elements of organized crime. You know, the rate of organized crime has increased uh, uh, during the COVID-19 uh, 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 lockdown. So there are a number of, of common factors that contribute to, to a country's vulnerability to organized crime. It has been uh, uh, well documented that organized crime groups exploit you know, certain conditions, which you just laid out, both of you. Uh, features such as conflict, lack of trust in state institutions, porous borders, social economic inequalities, lack of social cohesion, all of this contribute to an environment in which uh, organized crime can, can flourish. Uh, socioeconomic, I'm sorry, socio-demographic uh, uh, conditions may also influence the level and structure of organized criminal activities. Countries with uh, large youth populations, for example, may experience increased vulnerability to infiltration by organized crime, and, and thus may or may not be more susceptible to uh, uh, recruitment by criminal groups and also terrorist uh, violent extremist organizations. Rapid ur urbanization is, is a uh, 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 is, 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 is another element here, which can result in a situation in which a state may struggle to provide adequate uh, protection and social services. This creates a power vacuum that is, you know, uh, obviously captured by, uh, <clears throat> uh, by different actors, you know, and here it's, uh, it's organized crime. Climate change, you know, might be another, another factor. Uh, we have seen in the case of the Sahel and in CAT and, and elsewhere, you know, how uh, 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 conflicts stem in, at least in part, from drought, you know, land degradation, food insecurity are increasing. People are leaving their homes to flee these crises. Uh, they often compete with local populations for scarce resources. So this, the, the loss of arable land, the loss of what, you, what Kat said, livelihoods, uh, leave youth more vulnerable to recruitment by armed groups, by violent extremist organizations, and also by uh, organized criminals. And this brings me to, to, uh, to the second question. Uh, and I'll go back to Kat again. Uh, Kat, can you, can you assess the ways that, that mega trends like the youth bulge, urbanization, migration, or climate change, you know, they may amplify or attenuate African countries' vulnerabilities to transnational organized crime? And in, you know, in what ways are megatrends or can megatrends be sources of resilience? And in what ways you know, uh, are or can they become uh, sources of risk? Scott, please. 
Yeah, I, I think mega trends can be both. Um, they can be both sources of risk and sources of resilience. Um, which ways they play out kind of depends on, um, in part at least, on government policy planning and strategy, and also how people-centered these policies and strategies end up really being. Um, so I will probably not touch on all four of those, but let's look at demographic growth in the youth bulge as a potential source of both risk and resilience. So 60% of Africa's population in 2017 was under 25 years of age, and that makes it younger than any other region in the world. Um, and this youth bulge is projected to foster a 50% increase in population by 2035. So these are pretty staggering megatrends um, in this domain. Um, so when the youth bulge and urbanization are accompanied by high levels of unemployment, and when there are few social safety nets that the state can offer to its citizens, um, given these demographic trends, you know, people are likely to turn to whatever they can to try to make a living. And so I think, um, as touched on before, if criminal actors are looking to recruit small scale actors to get involved in facilitating their transnational organized criminal activities, they can certainly um, try to look to groups that are economically marginalized to try to make those criminal endeavors appealing. It doesn't always work, but certainly this demographic is, is potentially at risk and it's, it's a quite large swath of people. Um, youth are frequently prominent parts of that demographic in West Africa regionally, but also more widely. Um, on the other hand, youth who are organized to demand more transparent and accountable governance can be quite effective uh, in catalyzing movements for change um, over the longer term. Um, and so the work that those organized movements are doing from civil society, from outside of the government, are part of what's needed to strengthen social contracts between the state and citizens. And that is the foundation of any sort of lasting state legitimacy that could be developed or enhanced to further efforts um, that the state may want to engage in to counter transnational organized crime. So I think, um, put otherwise, we need a robust rule of law, a strong civil society, good independent government oversight mechanisms. All of this can contribute to rooting out the government corruption that often um, can facilitate criminal networks um, work on organized crime. Um, so urban-based citizens live closer together. They're easier to organize. Um, than people dispersed in rural areas oftentimes. And youth in urban areas in West Africa have shown their capacity in the past to organize around these good governance issues and demands. We've seen it with, um, just to cite a few examples, certainly not an exhaustive list, um, Ian Amar, the movement in Senegal, um, that has um, evolved over time since 2007 to make some of these demands and to promote engaged citizenship. The Le Ballet Citoyen in Burkina Faso um, also doing similar things. Um, I think there are other kinds of groups um, that youth are involved in that could play into this positive dynamic as well. Um, in terms of migration, I will just say a word or two here. That can also be a very good thing for African economies, for regional human capital, for development. Um, and there are long histories of labor migration in West Africa to build upon in that vein. But migration can also, under certain circumstances, play into some of these TO, uh, transnational organized crime or TOC dynamics. So in many countries in the region, there are people who are struggling to find jobs, find ways of supporting their families, finding ways to cope with unemployment and poverty. And they may feel pushed to venture into making journeys to other countries in search of better prospects. Some of those journeys are legal, others might be illegal. And some of those illegal journeys may involve people smuggling, which in and of itself is a form of transnational organized crime. It's when individuals are voluntarily engaging in some sort of irregular migration, trying to illegally enter another country with the help of others. Um, in the Sahel, as we all know, there have been major markets for this that move through broader West Africa, through the Sahelian countries, Mali, Niger, up through Libya to Europe. Um, and economic opportunity can certainly play a role in really difficult decisions that people are making to take on these dangerous journeys, which they often know are quite risky. Um, so I think generally there, with that megatrend, um, this particular aspect of migration, although the broader question of migration is much more nuanced, 
when people are traveling without legal documentation, as is the case with human smuggling, they're often moved along routes that are also used for arms or contraband smuggling. Uh, that compounds the penetration of different forms of organized crime into communities that are along that route. And those being smuggled are obviously in a very precarious position. And as such, they're also at higher risks for human trafficking, trafficking in persons, which is another related uh, but somewhat different pernicious form of transnational organized crime. I'll stop there. All right, thank you, Kat. <clears throat> and I'll ask the same question uh, uh, to Peter. Well, thank you, Anwar. And uh, Dr. Catherine has really done a wonderful job of highlighting uh, some of these uh, mega trends. And uh, I, we only just emphasize the fact that, as she said, uh, these need not be problematic <clears throat> for Africa and for African countries. But they can become problematic depending on how the <clears throat> react and deals uh, with them. Uh, so it's an issue, it's an opportunity, but it's also a challenge. And it, it requires really a strategic thinking in how to handle them. Uh, let me just expand a bit on uh, some of the mega trends that she did not highlight. Uh, with the biggest issue, which I think really is a, is, is a huge problem, climate change. And I think when we think about uh, megatrends, uh, these are large exogenous shock that can add uh, further constraints uh, to the challenges that uh, government capabilities face in Africa. And when, in terms of climate change, we know that um, uh, temperatures are expected to increase by average of two uh, degrees Celsius, uh, particularly in Africa. And this would have a varying effect uh, on different regions of Africa. Uh, in southern and northern Africa, for example, we know that uh, uh, the weather will become extremely hot. That will have huge implications on food productivity, on access to water, uh, pastures for some of the pastoralist groups uh, in, those, in those regions of Africa. In eastern Africa, where I come from, uh, the challenges are a bit different. Uh, what we are going to have in eastern Africa would be increase in torrential rains. And we began to see this actually this year in 2020. Uh, 2020 was a very challenging year for uh, Eastern and Horn of Africa. Uh, there was probably the largest discharge, discharge of water from Lake Victoria in over 100 years. Uh, and that has caused enormous flood uh, in the regions of South Sudan. Uh, and that came with uh, enormous human suffering, displacement of people, uh, and it just basically wipes out uh, livelihoods of, of these people. Uh, urbanization, as she talked about it before, uh, and it's really also a function of population growth. Uh, we know that our population in Sub-Saharan Africa is uh, ex uh, expected to double by 2050, <clears throat> 2015's level. Uh, we know that by 20, 2050, there will be one, uh, one billion people living in Sub-Saharan Africa who will be under the age of 18. And of course, this is a large increase in labor force. But if you have economies that are not growing, or when they are growing, they are growing in sectors that are not creating jobs, and they are not creating opportunities for younger people, uh, we know that this is going to be a huge problem uh, for uh, uh, stability and for criminal activities in the region. <clears throat> Uh, depending on the kind of strategies that the government are able to employ, we know that up to 85% of people living in extreme poverty could be located in Sub-Saharan Africa. And this will have huge implication uh, for everything that we do. And we know based on how our governments are per performing that most of the resources are spent in urban areas. Uh, in, for example, in South Sudan, for a very long time, so only 10% of the budget was really being spent in the countryside, and 90% of the resources were being consumed in Juba. Now, what does that do? It, uh, it leaves the rural areas behind, and as these young people grow up and have no access to uh, good living, and they also demand services like education, they begin to move to the cities. And they're moving to cities in a way that is not planned. African governments are not uh, having robust urbanization plans. So the areas that end up being crowded are slums. And I think someone asked a question before about why we see increase in transnational organized crime in South Africa. And it's primarily related to a number of these factors where you have a, a high population growth, you have a high unemployment of youth, particularly black youth, 
uh, that are not well educated. And they're all moving to cities in where they're staying in slums. And in slums, it's very difficult for police to operate and to provide law and order uh, in those kinds of environments. So in the end, uh, the depression, the poverty, this is going to encourage people. And we know that human beings are going to do everything that they can uh, to avoid dying of starvation. And uh, it's something that we expect, even with COVID, we don't expect people to allow themselves to die. We expect them to make sure they choose life. And choosing life means choosing livelihoods. And that may include finding ways in which you can put food on the table for your families. So these are going to be major challenge. The same thing with technology. Uh, we know technology is a huge exogenous shock. And it could go either way. It could increase challenges. It could enhance the capabilities of uh, uh, some of these actors that are trying to wreak havoc and instability, or it could create opportunities for economic growth. We know, for example, the region from which I come, uh, Eastern Africa, has done well really in uh, innovations uh, with mobile banking or with other new technologies that are providing access to health and uh, other resources for the population. But other regions in Africa have not done the same. And to be able to stay ahead of this game, it requires enabling environment. Uh, you need to provide education. You need to ensure that your universities are effective, that they are not just handing out degrees to students that can barely uh, spell a sentence. And we see this as a major challenge in many parts of Africa. So as she said before, this issue of megatrend uh, is an enormous challenge and uh, is something that cannot wait because the more you wait without addressing these things robustly, uh, it creates uh, really challenges that uh, will build on top of other existing challenges. And over time, it will be a problem uh, to actually have effective strategies uh, for addressing them. So it really requires, in my view, uh, strategic thinking. You think about 10 years from now, your population is only going to grow. There will be more and more young people entering uh, the labor market. What are the kind of sectors that is going to absorb this huge increase in, uh, in labor force? Uh, are those sectors going to be sectors that integrate to the economies of future? Do they factor in the issues of technologies, issues of research? Uh, are they going to enhance state capabilities? The same thing on the side of state capabilities. You think about where your capabilities are now, and you think now, in 10 years from now, with all these other challenges that are going to be coming and building on top of one another, how do you ensure that your capabilities are staying ahead of the game, that you are able uh, to ensure that uh, uh, states and uh, local authorities, the police, uh, are enhancing their capabilities, are, in, are anticipating uh, these challenges. The same thing with climate change. You don't have a way to go out of it. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a common problem that we all face at the world. And even if you reduce your emissions, uh, other countries are going to have the emissions and it's going to affect you. So how do you anticipate this challenge? We know what the impact is largely going to be. So how do you begin now thinking about mitigation measures in a way that will ensure that this does not have an enormously adverse effect on your people and on your societies? Uh, so uh, the jury is out, but we know these are going to be major challenges and the way in which they will play out will depend on how the state will react. <clears throat> Thank you, Peter. Uh, the pressures of you know mega trends, as as you both of you stated, I mean, will uh, necessitate uh, numerous and varied changes by uh, by African governments. And to do this successfully, uh, you know, what's required is incredibly strong political leadership. <clears throat> That's what's fundamental and, and essential. Uh, and a lot can be from what. You, you said, Peter and, and Kat, you know, can be gained from, you know, remembering the path already traveled and, and where we are today to be able to influence uh, more informed decisions because this, the stakes cannot be, uh, cannot be higher. I want to remind the participants to please, you know, start typing your, your questions uh, in English, uh, French, and, and Portuguese in the chat, please, because we will be moving to the Q&A uh, very, very shortly. Uh, so I'll go to the, the last questions, and I'll, uh, I'll start with Peter again. Uh, and this time we move to, you know, marginalized populations. So I would like you to reflect, you know, a bit on, on women and marginalized uh, populations and, and how they experience the effects 
of African states' vulnerabilities to transnational organized crime. What are some of the ways that, uh, that African uh, states' challenges with violence, state legitimacy, economic livelihoods that both of you, you know, have, have explained, how do they affect how women and, and marginalized groups perceive and react to transnational organized crime? And how these patterns change, you know, during COVID-19. Uh, so back to you, Peter. Well, thank you very much, uh, Anwar. And, you know, this question really brings what we are talking about from a theoretical level to the practical level. Because when we are talking about these mega trends, when we are talking about these vulnerabilities or abdication of duty by many African governments, we are talking about the impacts that it has in the lives of real people. And most of the time is really women and children that are bearing the brunt of uh, 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 inability of African government to respond to uh, organized crime. Uh, if you take, for example, uh, in 2019, uh, about 82% of under five uh, death and 86% of maternal uh, uh, mortality occur in Sub-Saharan Africa and in South Asia. And if you look at the ranking of the worst performers in all these categories, all of them are African, African countries, except for Yemen uh, in some of the in, in, in indices. Uh, the same thing, for example, uh, when you look at uh, the issue of conflict, we know that when a conflict occurs in a state, it really exposes uh, infants to mortality and on average, a child that is under the age of one has about 7.7% chances of dying within their first year uh, of life. And the same thing really for women of childbearing age, uh, the risk to mortality increases by more than 21% in environment of conflict. Uh, and we already know that uh, a lot of malnutrition uh, is heavily concentrated in Africa with 40% of the standard kit all around the world uh, being uh, uh, based in Africa. So these were already challenges that were happening and they were happening largely because as we talked before about uh, organized crime, at the center of it is the issue of corruption and uh, is the issue of state actors uh, creating a fertile in environment and really allowing uh, criminal organization, criminal networks to have a free hand in how they operate. The same thing with the issues of uh, child and women trafficking. These things were already happening and, and, and they've been happening because African states uh, are not investing in the, in the life of their people. We, we know that particularly in the region from which I come, uh, we are now really uh, way behind on uh, democratic governance, on uh, uh, democratic norms and uh, ability of state to invest in the lives of their people. So when that, that happens is the women and children that are bearing the brunt. Now with COVID, uh, what COVID has done is really to accelerate uh, some of the existing inequalities that were already inherent uh, in these countries. Uh, so when we talk about uh, child mortality or maternal mortality, now with the unique challenge of COVID where there has been lockdown in many parts of Africa, where livelihoods have been reduced, where uh, access to health has been reduced further, these numbers are only going to go up. And it means that more people are going to die, uh, more people's lives are going to be altered in unchangeable ways going forward. Take, for example, the issue of school closure. Uh, I know uh, I was in Kenya before I came to the US in the middle of the pandemic. And what they did in Kenya was to uh, shut down schools. Uh, and of course, it's understandable because uh, the internet access is very limited, uh, particularly in the large government schools. Uh, and the government decided that everybody is going to repeat uh, the next academic year. So now all the children have lost an entire academic year. And when you think of what the impact will be on girls, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, teenage pregnancies, uh, child marriages, this is going to be an enormous problem that would really uh, set us back in meeting uh, the gender, uh, in closing the gender gaps uh, that already existed. 
so COVID is going to enhance this. Uh, if you look, for example, in Uganda, not just only in livelihoods, but even in uh, uh, access to democratic space, uh, President Museveni has been able to uh, you know, put in very harsh conditions, uh, preventing people to campaign uh, because the existing media is favorable to him. Most of it is owned by people within his orbit uh, that give him free time to get, get his messages out. But for rivals that don't have the same access, you know, now he's using COVID as an, as a, as an excuse uh, to prevent some of the opposition groups to be able to campaign and to get their messages out. So this is a huge problem. But at the end of the day, when you put the lockdown, and we know, for example, 95% of youth in Africa, this is people between the age of 15 and 24, are only really employed in the informal sector. So they have to go out there every day to earn their living so that they don't die of hunger before they could potentially die of COVID. And you know, at some point you may die of COVID, but if you have nothing to eat, you know, you have a, a, a definite uh, probability of dying now of hunger. So people, of course, are choosing livelihoods. And you see the same thing in Ethiopia. Ethiopia is putting in these very harsh conditions, if you go there, you have to quarantine for two weeks. They put you to very expensive hotels to quarantine there. And we know majority of Ethiopians are, are employed in the informal sector. And it's very difficult for the government to prevent people to go and earn a living uh, when they are not offering anything. So it's not like in the West where there are these packages that the government is providing for their citizens to stay in the house and then they are sent some help and some checks. Here, there's nothing being provided and people are being asked to, to, to stay locked down. And this is not working. So you end up uh, seeing uh, that what COVID has done is really to amplify the vulnerabilities and it caught African governments unable already prepared for these kind of challenges. And, and just lastly, uh, Anwar, uh, when we talk about megatrend, just to uh, bring back the, the, the previous issue, the issues of uh, not just COVID, but epidemics is a major challenge, is a, is a part of these mega trends that we are talking about. And as we were talking before about the growing populations, about the poor standards in cities where people are staying in, in, in slums, uh, these create an environment where viruses can easily move around. And we know with COVID, which originated from China, is primarily related to some of these conditions where a large number of people are staying in very close spaces. The health standards are very poor and all kinds of different viruses are floating in the air. And it takes only one virus to mutate in a certain way for it to create a, a global pandemic. So going forward uh, is something that we need to incorporate into our thinking and into how we think about uh, uh, safeguarding the livelihoods of our people, knowing that COVID will not be the last pandemic. <clears throat> Thank you, Peter. Uh, Peter talked about the devastating uh, effects that, uh, that COVID has on, on, uh, on Africans, and particularly the most uh, vulnerable, uh, the marginalized, the women, youth, uh, etc. Uh, the effects, again, of same thing, challenges, uh, state legitimacy and economic livelihoods. So I'll turn to Kat, same, same questions again. If you can touch also on how these groups perceive uh, and react to transnational organized crime. Kat. Sure. Um, so in terms of transnational organized crime issues that require using a strong gender lens, I mean, um, we should always be using a gender lens, but um, let me say in particular a few words on human trafficking, um, which also came up with Peter um, very rightfully. Um, this is recruitment, harboring, transport, transfer, or reception of people for the purposes of exploitation. And it occurs through coercive or, or, or fraudulent means. Um, so we can find examples of uh, human trafficking in any country in West Africa or the Sahel or, or um, elsewhere in Africa. Um, let me just give you one example um, from Nigeria that's pretty illustrative. Um, so if we look in Borno State in Northeastern Nigeria in the Madinatu uh, camp for internally displaced people, We've seen recent reports of poor young female uh, IDPs, internally displaced persons, um, being targeted by recruiters who are supposedly offering them jobs somewhere outside of the camp um, in more urban areas, 
they're moved out of the camp if they accept this, and then um, have been shown to have been forced into sexual slavery or even into bearing children who were then sold on the black market in the region. And so um, in past Africa Center discussions about this topic, you know, some participants from um, you know, Nigeria, um, other countries in, in that part of West Africa have really pointed to us the urgency of addressing these uh, baby factories, so, as they're called, in the region. And we see them operating not just in Nigeria, but Benin, Niger, um, some, other, some other countries um, uh, around uh, the same spot. Um, so this has been highlighted as, as, as one way. Um, you know, men and boys, but women and girls in particular, uh, are frequently um, experiencing some of the effects of TOC, transnational organized crime. Um, reporting on this particular IDP camp, um, I noticed emphasized how lack of potable water in the camp, lack of firewood, um, much less livelihoods um, can motivate, um, you know, uh, some of this. Um, so people are more vulnerable to recruiters who are trying to prey upon folks in these uh, compromising situations and then decept the deceptive tactics sort of um, uh, are particularly useful, I guess, have been proven to be particularly, um, you know, uh, useful for, for recruiters in those contexts. So that's just one example in, from this particular form of transnational organized crime um, that female youth in particular are experiencing. I think all West African countries um, are source destination and transit countries for trafficking in persons. And TIP in its various forms, whether we're talking about sex trafficking or labor trafficking, affect both men and boys and women and girls across the region. But of course, we see from this anecdote um, and, and other reporting um, that the impact on women is particularly strong. Um, I'll say a word as well on politically and economically marginalized communities um, that may also be having particular experiences of transnational organized crime. So on the one hand, certain economies that are linked to um, organized crime, like the human smuggling economy that used to be very vibrant in Agadez as in Niger, or the drug economy in Northern Mali, these can provide some elements of political and economic stability in communities and settings that would otherwise be fragile um, for, for um, lack of other significant uh, economic opportunities. So people in these communities, if you talk to them, um, just based on study, the studies out there that I have seen, they're not that many, but there are some, you know, not everybody may consider all of these organized criminal activities as entirely negative if they're providing opportunities to help keep some form of order in play in their communities. And some people in these communities may also not think about taking jobs related to trafficking or smuggling as something that's necessarily illegitimate. Um, so what we mean by legitimacy and illegitimacy um, may contrast with legality and illegality sometimes. At the same time, it's members of these marginalized communities who are often bearing the brunt of different consequences of organized criminal groups embedding themselves and in some cases interacting with violent extremist groups in the region as well. Um, so in a number of cases across West Africa, violent extremist groups are taxing the flows of drugs or arms or other uh, products of organized crime um, when these transnational organized crime networks must move through territory that the extremist groups control. And so this is all to say um, organized crime, terrorism, and making a living are intimately linked, and they're pretty hard to fully untangle from one another, especially when we think about marginalized communities' perspectives on it. Um, uh, that's not to say that's the only perspective in the, uh, these very diverse communities, but it's one that's notable. So um, to end, in terms of how things have changed with COVID-19, I think um, the verdict is, the full verdict is still out. Um, we saw ECOWAS countries closing their land and air borders after the appearance of the virus in the region. Um, there are some analysts who worry that these border closures might lead less professionalized criminal actors to drop out of transnational criminal endeavors. And this could consolidate the grip of really professionalized, um, sometimes more violent criminal networks that can still afford to try to expend resources and take the extra risks needed to get around some of these new restrictions. Um, so that's one thing. 
informal economies are squeezed, so there's a need for other livelihood opportunities more than ever before, as per what Peter said. Women, even more so than men, are dependent on these informal economies for their livelihoods, so that's a key element. Um, with fewer social services being provided, with schools being closed, there are fewer um, economic opportunities, and so children as well may be at greater risk for um, trafficking in persons, for exploitation. Um, I think we've also seen um, shifting or new markets um, for transnational organized crime. Even in places like Senegal, which since 2014 has had um, committees, um, interagency committees focused on fighting the traffic in fake medicines in the region. Um, we've seen fake chloroquine uh, being trafficked and that's not just you know, marginalized populations. This is across all swaths of society. Um, you've seen an uptick in things like that. And then finally, we've seen um, maritime as opposed to land routes um, have been shifted into in some places for drug trafficking. And that might affect which different communities um, uh, you know, are involved in this phenomenon. And it might also shift our attention to different state actors who might be the enablers of transnational organized crime in these um, unprecedented times. Thank, thank you, Kat, and thank you, Peter. Um, this will uh, bring us to the end of this uh, of this section. Uh, just wrapping up quickly, um, you know, organized uh, or transnational organized crime, uh, as we have heard I mean, over and over again, is an outcome of of, of weak systems of, of of governance, you know, state reach, and this uh, undermines effective state building. And we have heard uh, uh, data and some st statistics that show us how, you know, uh, transnational organized crime obviously, you know, happening throughout throughout the world, but um, an appreciable number occurs in countries experiencing low levels of economic well-being, uh, insufficient government capacity, uh, societal divisions, uh, etc. So transnational criminal networks they erode state legitimacy. Uh, by incentivizing, uh, we have heard Peter talk about this corruption, you know, infiltration of state structures, uh, uh, competition uh, with the state and the provision of, of services. So transnational organized crime undermine the, uh, the, the strength of the state and the state is already weak in, in, this, in this instance. It affects the, that critical and contested relationship between the state and society. And this is particularly compounded in fragile and conflict affected states where we already have uh, you know, the degraded nature of this relationship. And that prevents progress, unfortunately, towards greater peace, towards greater prosperity. So it's clear that there is no single resilience measure that offers a one size fits all for uh, uh, to organize the crime. What works in one country may prove to be effective, uh, ineffective in, in, in another. So responses must take into account the context. Uh, and that's why it was uh, really nice, uh, you know, to hear Peter from the East African context, uh, Kat bring her expertise, uh, you know, West, Central, uh, Central Africa. Uh, so even in the same country, response measures that may have worked in the past may not fully work. I mean, to tackle uh, uh, these addressing, these evolving uh, criminal trends. Uh, 